today we're going to talk about monoid objects in monoidal categories. Now, this is a story, one of the usual stories of category theory, where we take something that we know and love and that we're very familiar with, such as a monoid, and we look at it and say, hmm, well, we did monoids in the category of sets and functions, basically. Could we try and do it in any other category? And so the first thing we have to do is re-express the original definition just using the objects and morphisms of the category of sets. And once we've done that, we can then just pick it up and plonk it in some other categories um, as long as we've got enough features of the category that we're, we're looking for. So in the case of monoids, what we're going to see is that we use the category of sets and functions together with the Cartesian product in that category, in, in the category of sets. And so we can do this in any category that's got something a bit like a Cartesian product. In fact, we don't need it to be a Cartesian product, we just need it to be a monoidal category structure. So this is what we're going to look at, monoid objects in other monoidal categories other than the category of sets and functions. So first of all, let's remind ourselves what a monoid is. A monoid is a set equipped with, so we better call this set something, it's a set, uh, let's call it A, equipped with, well, it's got um, a binary operation which we might write as things like, uh, for every A and B, we have an A, com uh, an A composed of B like that. So for all A and B in A, we have some element A, B, and A. We also have a unit object. So we have a unit, which we could call E, which is an object of A. And then we have associativity and unit axioms. So we've got for all A, B, and C in A, A, B, C equals A, B, C, and also for all A in A, E composed with A, E multiplied by A equals A equals A, E. So now let's try and re-express this. You see, all over the place we've used elements of this set. And if we're going to do it in some arbitrary other category, we've just got to use objects and morphisms of the category. So what we're going to have here, what we've got is a set A, that's fine. This is, in, this is an object of our category of sets and functions. So our binary operation, we could express it as something from, it's a morphism, a function from A cross A to A. Okay, so here we define it as something that, that takes the pair AB and goes to A multiplied by B. But fundamentally, it's just a function A cross A to A. So you see we're using the Cartesian product here. Now what about this unit? This is, we've got to pick out an object of A. Well, we can do that by specifying a function from the terminal set to A. Because what does a function from the terminal set to A do? Well, there's only one object in here, so all it does is it picks out an object in there. Um, and now we've got to have the associativity and unit laws. Well, we can express the associativity law like this. We've got to take three elements, right? So that's going to be something in A cross A cross A. Let's call this multiplication mu. Uh, then what we've got to do is we've got to multiply first on the left and leave the right-hand side one alone. And this takes us just to A cross A, okay? And then we're going to do mu on there, and that takes us down to A. Down the other side, we could have done, we could have done mu on the right, and then mu afterwards. So here we're taking a triple, A comma B comma C, and we're sending it to A times B comma C, and then finally we're sending it to A, B, C, and down the other side we're doing, doing it the other way. So finally we've got this unit axiom, and I didn't quite leave myself enough space over there, so I'll come over here. This unit axiom says, well, what, what have we got to do here? We've got to pick out E and an A. So what that says is if we start with 1 cross A, we can use our unit map to pick out pick out our element E in here, and then we multiply, and we get back down to A. And that's canonically isomorphic to just A, and this should be the same thing coming down here. So on the right-hand side, we 
we've got something very similar. We've got a cross 1 being isomorphic to a. Here, we do 1 cross with eta. So what that does is it picks out in here little a, comma, e, because the, the right-hand side takes 1, the terminal set, and sends it to e, and that's got to be the same as, as doing the identity there. So now we can just take this definition and put it in some other monoidal category and give ourselves the notion of a monoid object. So let's um, wipe this part out. So a monoid object in a monoidal category C is an object A equipped with uh, equipped with one cells, that is morphisms, those two morphisms. So we've got to have something from 1 to A called eta, and we've got to have something from A tensor A to A called mu. And then it's got to satisfy two axioms. Satisfying associativity and unit axioms. Of course, if it isn't a strict monoidal category, then we're going to have to assert some associate, insert some associators in there. So let's uh, let's wipe this off. No, let's not. Let's write it here. So what we're going to have is, on the one hand, a tensor a tensor a. We'll have to insert an associativity constraint in here to get ourselves to a tensor. A tensor A, but then we can do everything exactly as it was before. Um, of course, I've done it the other way up from that one, which isn't very helpful of me, so perhaps I should do it the other way around. Um, we've got A tensor A tensor A being associated that way around to A tensor A tensor A, and then when we come along the top here, we can do mu tensor 1 and then mu. And down here, we can do 1 tensor mu, and then mu. And so that's what associativity says. And then the unit axiom, we have to do something. Uh, it's that thing that I just wiped off. So this gives us the definition of a monoid object in a monoidal category. In the category of sets, it just gives us back the usual definition of a monoid. And what we'll see next time is that if we do this in the monoidal category of monoids, then we'll get a commutative monoid back out again. And that's exactly by the Ekman-Hilton law. So that's what we'll do next time.